few of us closely, uh, I think this is a clear testimony of what this project <coughs> is going to achieve. Next, on the program, uh, is addressed by the guest speaker. This is a bit uh, difficult for me because I am a bit conflicted as I have known uh, the guest speaker for over 30 years. But this gentleman from a young age has been a very high achiever with a strong desire to put his country on the map. At the young age of 14, he won the World Piano Prize, Grade 3, Piano Fort, 1979, in Cardiff, Wales, which was a source of great pride for many Gambians at the time. For all of you that are millennials that were born um, after that time, you will not understand, but in 1979, to hear that Gambia won something in the world stage was something to be proud of. So you need to put your hand up, especially in the millennials. He went to the university, uh, he did his university education in Nigeria and graduated with a BSc honors in biochemistry. Sensing the call of God upon his return, he founded and started the Abiding God Ministry. On a Sunday of November 5th, 1988. For the past three decades, he has carefully built his ministry with integrity and excellence, strengthening members to discover and utilize their God given potential. Many church members, among whom I humbly stand, one of them, who have since moved on to different countries, continue to give testimony to the impact of this phenomenal ministry in building them into the people they are like. Through his nationally popular and well-received weekly GRTS telecast, Discovery Truth, this God-fearing life has been able to reach people throughout the nation across, across socio-political lines for over two decades with messages on empowerment, national development, love for country, love for God and country that have resonated deeply with men. As a result, his name is now a household name, adding him with the enviable title the nation's past. Discovering truth has helped a lot of individuals and the nation as a whole to clean and implement the wise counsel he has so eloquently given on a weekly basis for the past 23 years non-stop. His ability to consistently reach out with a message of hope to people across socio-political and religious lines has always placed him in a unique position to serve as an effective facilitator, mediator in many trainings as well as intermediary settings. This gentleman is widely read. His objective is an objective minister whose integrity and sense of focus have been tested time and time over and proven untainted. He survived the dictatorship untainted and without bias. I am one to testify that knowing him over 30 years, he has not received a monthly salary from the ministry he started, and he has kept his financial integrity intact. Not a A very busy man who travels regularly to fulfill international pulpit preachings and teachings and worship ministry engagements. Coaching, mentoring, and 
advising, public speaking, counseling, and some of the other areas, he fulfills his God given call, his God calling upon his life with infectious passion, simplicity, and practicality, and great depth and insight, competence, and with three decades of ministry, of the ministry, of three, three decades of ministry experience. He's married, he's happily married, and ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome a man of integrity, a man of tainted, a man that has kept his neutrality over time, a man that has consistently served his motherland, passionate for Gambia, the Reverend Francis Sostopo. Just saying to Horija that sometimes you wonder whether you are the one they are talking about. <laughs> and um, thank you so much. Um, it looks like the order of the day is to say all protocols respectfully <laughs> and dutifully observed. So I will do that because I really honor those who have the order. I think when you do that order, you must have it right. If not, um, uh, social cohesion itself will not work. So I'm not too sure whether you put the Lord spiritual and temporal before. So all protocols respectfully observed. We are all covered. Good morning, everybody, and thank you. Let me start by expressing my thanks to CRS Caritas and the TRRC for this invitation and for putting together what I believe is a critical way forward for our country, especially as we approach the last quarter of this year and praying for a better 2020. Social cohesion for peace building in the Gambia. For me, this topic assumes and presumes a couple of things which, in my opinion, are critical for us. It's no gain saying that something has gone wrong, nationally wrong, and something that threatens our social cohesion and national unity. And so we have a problem. And knowing and agreeing that you have a problem is halfway down the pathway to solving the problem. Unfortunately, time has divided us, and frighteningly so, along tribe, religion, party politics, levels of denials, betrayals, and an unusually inordinate Gambian desire for one another's downfall. We never used to be like that. But gladly, ladies and gentlemen, this is fixable, and I believe as I speak to you this morning, it is not too late. Peace for which we have all been well known in the past years, continentally and very likely globally, especially in the way we transition from the Jammeh regime to this present transitional government period, showed that we were a people that were able to harness peace, almost like somebody can hold a hand grenade and remove the pin and nothing happening. Unfortunately, that peace suffered trauma that has taken a national scale. But peace is a requisite for nation building and national development, and its absence dashes all hopes of progress due to the destructive forces in operation and their attendant consequences um, that we all too well are now seeing. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to go far. Sierra Leone, Liberia, and then Rwanda are uh, living testimonies and examples of how it works. I am told um, from statistics or otherwise that when a nation loses her peace, it basically takes about 25 years for them to come back together. 25 years from now, I will be 
approaching 80. So per personally, I don't even have that time. And I believe none of us has that time. 22 years of the last regime led to polarization of this country, polarization of the Gambian society along tribal, cultural, religious lines by the rhetoric of our then leadership. And that is what we need to fix. And one of the best qualitative characteristics that has been tested over time to fix this disconnect is called social cohesion. And so by definition, simply put, as you have heard, social cohesion is defined as the willingness of members of a society to cooperate, to work together for their common good, for their common survival, and for our common prosperity. So the operative words are willingness and cooperation. In the absence of these two words, we will continue having the problems that we have. And so fostering social cohesion brings about the striving for greater inclusiveness, more civic participation, and the creation of opportunities for a national upward mobility. As has been said, social cohesion is the glue in wall of the call. It's the glue that holds us, that binds us together, bringing one of the bees, four bees that we had. It is that glue that holds our societies together, without which societies fragment, and distrust and prejudice ensue, and eventually anarchy reigns as the society's moral and social fabric is torn into shreds. We need each other, Gambia. No man is an island. No woman is an island. There is a law called the law of summation that in being paraphrased will tell you that the total output at this end is directly proportional to the total output of the individual constituent parts that make it. So the end point is a consequence and must be a logical consequence for us. As a pastor, I read in my Bible about three or four passages. One goes like this, that the entire body grows together by that which every joint supplies, not takes away. So for growth to come cumulatively, every joint, every constituent part of the nation must come together for the body of the Gambia to grow. There is a king in the Bible who was going to war and he kind of figured out that he may not be able to win this battle by himself and his forces. So he called onto another king for assistance and asked him, will you go with, to fight with me? And this was the king's response, and I quote, I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. We are one and the same. If I fail, you fail. If I succeed, you have succeeded. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, social cohesion is a deliberate choice, must be a deliberate Gambian choice, a deliberate Gambian decision, a deliberate Gambian agreement, a deliberate Gambian mindset. It is the thinking of interdependence between me as an individual and the society to which I proudly belong, the Gambian society. Let me break and say that just because I tend to travel quite regularly, about eight to nine times in the year, I'm out of the country preaching or doing something. I used to pride myself many years ago um, to start with my country before I preach. And one of the things I would say was that I come from the most peaceful country in Africa and arguably in the world. And I tell them that my country is so wonderful that in those days, and what I'm about to say is true, in those days, at least 15, 20, 20 years ago, if you had planned to travel to the United Kingdom, let's say on today, and you had applied to the British High Commission then, and you got your visa, and I remember being called at my office to come and collect my visa and my passport by 10.30. If you had packed your luggage ahead of time, you will drive in your car 
with your luggage in your boot to the British High Commission, collect your visa, drive down this road to Gambia Experience by Sandy Gambia Hotel, buy your Gambia Experience ticket, drive 15 minutes, now there is traffic, 15 minutes to the airport, board Gambia Experience Monarch, arrive in London, Gatwick, North or Southern Terminal, all in the same day. That was our country. I used to boast about it because I've literally done it before. Something went wrong. So that glue that held us together is being weakened. And Gambian, non-Gambian, regardless of our political, ethnic, gender, regional, religious affiliation, consideration, or prejudice or learning must live together and work for this glue to come together. Social cohesion, ladies and gentlemen, is built on three keys or around three keys. Social inclusion, one. Social capital, two. Social mobility, three. Social in inclusion refers to that degree to which all citizens, each one of us, can participate on equal footing in the economic, social, and political life, and including whether people are protected in times of need. Social capital refers to the trust between us and our institutions, giving us a sense of belonging to society, letting society know that we count and we matter and our values and opinions are taken seriously. Social mobility refers to the equality we all have of opportunity to get ahead. It's what the Americans call the American dream, that you can come from any country of the world and if you are focused and you work hard, you can become a millionaire. There are Gambians who are Gambian American millionaires and probably billionaires. And if that is possible by that American dream, as we work with social cohesion, one of these days we must be able to say we have Gambian made in the Gambian millionaires, billionaires because of the social cohesiveness of our nation and we don't begrudge their millions, we don't begrudge their billions, rather we look at them and aspire to be like them because social mobility, social capital, social inclusionism gives us the platform for that possibility to become a reality. The questions we must be asking fellow Gambians are, number one, is there true social cohesion in our Gambia, in the new Gambia? What are the potential or even the obvious structures in our society now? Again, tribal, political, ethnocultural, regional, religious. Are we witnessing a breakdown of this social fabric that once held us together? What is our Gambianness today? At some point, ladies and gentlemen, there was something uniquely Gambian that bound us together. This is one country that you came pre-94, and maybe the early years of 94, and you found that almost every Gambian household's wall was just about a meter and a half high. And our friends from Sierra Leone, particularly Big Brother Nigeria, wondered, why do you have such low walls? Thieves will come. Thieves were extinct almost in the Gambia. You would leave your car parked anywhere and nobody will touch it. And if it rained, a good Gambian will open your door and wind up your window for you and not touch your car. It was a fact that you could work with your monthly salary or your bonus in the Republic of the Gambia from morning till the next morning and nobody will touch you. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1986, in 1986, I brought five of my friends from university and, and they stayed in the Gambia. The ladies stayed with my friend Nema Jawara, Nema Udom, President Jawara's uh, first daughter in the house there in Bakau by the basketball pitch. And um, I drove my friends to Banjul and when we passed mile two, I told them this is our national prisons. And my roommate who was Nigerian, is Nigerian, said to me, is it the people who quarrel in the market that you bring here? Because this place is so peaceful, we don't see any crime here. That was the Gambian nest. But ladies and gentlemen, it has been traumatized. It has been fought. The fabric has been stretched and broken. 
We were a friendly people, a peaceful people, a helpful people, a considerate people, a united people. There is a need to capture, recapture that Gambianness, that oneness right now before it's too late. So we bring about a unity of vision for our nation, a deep sense of brotherhood. I grew up with Baba Lee. I was born in Dipakunda. I am a Dipakunda boy. I know Jaitakunda. I know Swai Bukonet's house. I know Musuke Badrame's house. I was born at home. I did not even allow myself to enjoy the luxury of a hospital. I came out at my own time and grew up in Dipakunda. And so some people think I am not, I don't speak well of. I am a Dipakunda boy and I enjoyed everything Gambian and proudly talk about it. Only when things went wrong did I not have the liver, the courage to boast about my country as I move around the world. But I trust I will be able to do that soon. I must say this though, and I say it with a bit of shame to me, because of my annual program, I wasn't able unfortunately to vote on the 1st of December 2016. I actually tried to see if I could fly in from New York, get a flight, vote and fly back to New York one day and then fly back to London the next day and fly back to Florida. That's how tight the schedule was. But because you know you can have internet in the air now in some um, European airlines and Ethiopian airlines have started it, I was monitoring the results. And I was in Sheraton Hotel Park Lane in London, right there by Hyde Park Corner, and suddenly it Bleep that President Yaya Jame, ex-president, had conceded. I fell flat on the ground and I prayed and I thanked God. I didn't know my friends were snapping me. Ladies and gentlemen of this August gathering of social uh, 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 cohesion, everybody, I had three phones on me, two Gambian phones, sorry, one Gambian phone, uh, a phone with my British SIM and my US SIM. They were all hot. They were ringing off the hook. Gambia, Gambia, Gambia has done it. Small Gambia, my mentor, who is coming here in November, called me and said, is it true? Is it really true? I said, we have done it. Seven days later. <laughs> the glue that was coming together was being stretched apart again. As somebody put it, we were known on the global stage for all the great reasons. No African country had done what we had done without anybody dying. That was the peace that we had, and that's the peace we must have again. It is not too late, ladies and gentlemen. I spoke at the first CEO conference on a Tuesday. When I finished speaking, it was announced that President Jawara had passed on. So we stood for a minute silence. And because I was flying out on the next day, the Wednesday, and I knew I would not be able to attend the funeral, which I had to attend, I went to the house to pay my condolences to Lady Chilel and the wider family, walked out, ambushed by GRTS, and got interviewed. And I took note, as you took note, the continental, the regional, the almost global outpouring of emotion and grief and shock, even though he was 95. We knew he would go, but we could not bear because Sadada had come to be immortalized in Gambia. Sadada had come to live forever. Why? Not because he was the only boy born in Barajali, but because he, uh, he, uh, he embodied law, human rights, democracy. He didn't tamper with our national institutions. He allowed things to be. And so we wept, we cried, we couldn't believe it. I have an image of Sadawda that will never leave me. 1979, back out CFA supermarket then. I was shopping with my dad, rather my dad was shopping with me because he had the money. And we came to the <laughs> supermarket till and we, he was paying. And as he was paying, somebody was nudging my dad. And my dad turned and saw this big bully, maybe Sergeant Johnson then, ADC to President Jawara who had come from golf, you know, and President Jawara said to my dad, go ahead, Francis, it's your turn. Just go ahead, it's your turn. And I thought, if it was Second Republic, <laughs> both the supermarket owner and everybody will be in the hotel. But that's the Gambia I grew to know. And for those who are being called millennials, like my daughter, who was born in 1993, October, you have grown not to know about Sadauda. You have grown not to know about the peace and the human rights and the justice 
and what we enjoyed. I give you a second story. When I did Common Entrance in 1976, I was one of three people who came, became seventh in the country. Myself, I sat to Kombewada, Njai, and Bachibaldi. We were the three that had 300 marks, the first person having 321. So we were number seven in the country. Naturally, I had a government scholarship, and I had it till university. My older sister, immediate older sister, um, I remember she had 216, two years before our time. And the cut-off mark was 216. But the problem was there were four candidates with 215. And Marquesa Ayodele Forbes was the last. And the line was drawn right above her name. Her father was a regional education officer. Her father and mother have contributed to sports, to religion, to education, to many things you know. But my parents were not going to fight for it and try and go under the carpet and get a scholarship because when my father asked, the official answer was that the family can afford it. And the family could afford it, and we did it. Ladies and gentlemen, I remember 1983. After my first year in university, I had government scholarship in my second year. I had to go to the Ministry of Education and sit before a board. I remember until Lena Manga and be interviewed and be questioned, not to be given because I'm Forbes or because I'm Mandinka or because I'm three years or five years or BYM or Green Boys, Blue Boys, Pink Boys. I had to go. And if I did not perform, I would not get that scholarship. I don't know whether there is still a scholarship interview today or whether people have the scholarship even before they take the exams. <laughs> so when Jawara died, we mourned because that was our nostalgic past. That was what we knew because of what he stood for and who he was. Then came 1994. And our hopes were high because we were sold a mantra. The era of accountability, the era of transparency, the era of probity, leaders with a difference, or rather, let me say it as they said it, soldiers with a difference. Little by little, every thread of our national, social, religious, tolerant, moral fabric began to be drawn from this cloth called Gambian unity and Gambian cohesion. Suddenly tribal prejudice came to our faces. Blatant religious favoritism, nepotism, corruption. We lost our social capital. We destroyed our national social fabric. Suddenly we found it within ourselves to report one another and joyfully watch each other being killed, maimed, made to disappear, exiled, and we gathered joy somehow. The rest of us remained in denial and doubted everything, blaming people from Guinea-Bissau, blaming people from Casamans. Thank God for the TRRC. They opened it to us so that we could tell that it's Banjul, Jones Street, it is Serekunda, it is Kotu, it is Bijilo, it is Farato. It is all our violence on ourselves, us on ourselves. You would never have thought that would happen, but it came. Corruption, reverse psychology, Jola versus Mandika, the Akus in Fajara had their own to do, hate, mistrust, lack of respect, lack of respect for age, for age and experience. Ladies and gentlemen, I would never dream as young as I am at 55 of being rude to an elder. I've been in places either in the airport buses or in meetings or at banking lines when they say, oh, pastor, go ahead. You are a pastor. I said, no, why am I mad? Why am I mad? Why am I mad? And we have this exercise. And somebody said to me, I'm glad you know that. Many people don't know that. Yes, I am Pastor Forbes. With all the things that have been read about me, these are still elders ahead of me. I will not presume that because of a title, a name, a function, a responsibility, that I have arrived somewhere. That in itself breaks our fabric. And that is one big part of social, excuse my language, this cohesion that we have to work with the children born from 1994 
to now. Maybe we should call them the Gambian millennials or the German generation children. But you see lack of respect. You, you just don't get it. We were not like that and that is not Gambian. And that must not be sold as Gambian. We Gambians are respectful of religion, respectful of authority, respectful of age. Auntie Adelaide is my witness. We belong to the same uh, group. One Saturday we finished and she said, Pastor, would you give me a ride? I said, I'll, she said, drop me at the junction. And I thought, how can I drop this woman at the junction? I said, where do you live, ma? She said, just take me down the road. I dropped her right in front of her gate. If I had the ability, I would lift her and carry her into her house. That is how we were brought up, Gambian. That is the nation that I am proud to call my nation. I don't have two passports. I don't need two passports. I am Gambian, proud to be Gambian. And the things that have disconnected us, we must all work together. And I'm so grateful that Caritas, the TRFC, and CRS are working this hard. I won't take time to bother you with how I felt as a Christian. I was having dinner with my wife that Friday. I can never forget because Friday is our date night. And somebody sent me a text and said the country has been declared an Islamic Republic. Automatically, I felt second class. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, you may laugh. But a lot of the wars in this world today are based on religion. When you disenfranchise the people, when you tread upon their moral persuasion, you cannot tell. America thought the bombs were machines, and they discovered that the bombs could be people. You cannot demilitarize a human being. You cannot suck out his thoughts of being badly dealt with from his head he can smile and do things she can smile and do things you and i can smile and do things because ladies and gentlemen what goes on in the human heart only god knows we need to pick ourselves together we prided in our civil service we prided people came here to study the gambian civil service but we ended up defending wrong Defending corruption. There is a phrase that was inextricably linked and synonymous, excuse me, with Nigeria. It's our time to chop. That phrase has taken on its own Gambian meaning. It's our time. It was the Jola's time. It's the Mandinka's time. It is the Aku's time. No passport in the Gambia carries our tribe. It rather carries our nationality because we are all one. Taking you back to the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, there is a book called Ecclesiastes in the 10th chapter, verse 5, 6, and 7. Kindly listen to this. There is an evil which I have seen under the sun, and the evil is an error which proceeds from the ruler. Folly, foolishness, is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in the lowly place. I have seen servants riding horses and princes walking on the earth. When a society has malfunctioned and disconnected and become dis and uncohesive, this is what you have. Folly, foolishness is celebrated. We lived in an era when we were told by the office of the president how we must refer to our president. And we had to memorize it, SPAD, 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 Chef Professor Alhaji Doctor. We just had to memorize it. And you keep wondering which part is the sheikh, which part is the alhaji, which part is the professor. But we had to do it. And you and I seated here, every government function, as long as they started sheikh, we all clapped. Folly is set in high places. That is what became of us. And you looked at people who did it. People who had been to the ivory towers of the world. People who have worked in international associations, bowing down to folly. But God is so good to this country. And 2016 December, we cried unto him. He gave us a turnaround. That is why I keep saying God intervened before Gambia decided. God intervened and changed our nation. So finally, ladies and gentlemen, we must now work towards weaving a new fabric. Because as you know, you say it, but it comes from the Bible. You cannot put new wines 
in old bottles. You cannot sew a new piece of cloth to an old fabric. They will both tear. It's a tear. It's a lose-lose uh, 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 situation. Like President Jawara, I will call upon our present president, President Adama Barrow. President Jawara had the political will and he manifested it in his life. Government policies must make a major difference so we can forge a new Gambianness devoid of the worrisome signs we are seeing and the flashpoints we are seeing. My wife and I traveled on the 28th of August, just almost three weeks ago. When we were leaving, it was President Jawara that had died. By the time we came back, there was 37 people in prison. There was diplomatic passport. It's like the issues are happening every week. Policy must stop it. And not just policy rehashed rhetorically, policy by precept, by lifestyle, and by example. So that we curb blatant corruption, state pilferage, nepotism, tribal bigotry, even caste system, and religious intolerance. Ladies and gentlemen, if that happens, we're going to have a beauty for a country. We're going to have a great country whose leader is an example, whose leader is a leader for all. And forgive me to be biased, but I must say I want to take almost judicial notice that my president has visited every mosque and every place and not yet one church. But we are still in this country. It must be seen because you are not the president for one religion, one faith, one village, one tribe. You are the president for all. When you take those responsibilities, you depersonalize even your own prejudices and you come out and become the father of the nation. That's why we wept when President Jawara died because every one of us here had a testimony of how neutral he was. We must press the reset button, Gambia. We must press the reset button, start all over again, build national reorientation programs, programs required to restore trust between groups and tribes in the Gambia, to ensure effective cohesion, social cohesion. The government, this government, and any subsequent government must bring civility and sanity to the body politic of the Gambia to ensure that the people's power and freedoms are not trampled, trampled upon by the state and that democracy, rule of law, press freedom, human rights, equitable justice, and development drive and are firmly rooted in the system of government and guarded by an atmosphere of peace, security, and tranquility. There is a need to develop, ladies and gentlemen, and nurture the culture of democratic prosperity, meritocracy, fighting corruption by example, the eschewing of tribal and religious favoritism, patronage, and bigotry for a better country. When that happens, we will discourage the climate of vilifying personalities, trivializing education academia, blocking religious expression, and political divergent opinions. Accountability will be the order of the day, whether it's the Justice Department, the National Assembly, whatever are the outcomes of the TRRC, the Janet Commission, the Farababanta Commission report, they will be held out of respect for the people because for crying out loud, people lost their lives in some of these things. We also, the citizenry, must learn to honor and respect leadership both local Gambian and diasporan Gambian. And if I can say this louder than I, I'm doing now, I'll say it. Let's learn as Gambians to kill the social media insults. There is no country in this world where the citizens are insulting themselves on social media like the Gambia. Why? It's all social disconnect. But we are embarking upon training. We are embarking upon the things going. Last night on the television, I saw the TRRC or Caritas or CRS signing something all so that we can come together and fight corruption, novo rich corruption, stonewalling, turning a blind eye, responding and being proactive rather than reacting or even not reacting. Having advisors who will speak truth to those who have called them to advise them and not to agree with them. If we do all these things conscientiously, ladies and gentlemen, we shall be reweaving the nation's social fabric back into cohesion, the glue 
will start walking again. Holding us all and sundry together as one people under God. Loving ourselves. Being our brothers and sisters keepers. Watching out for and celebrating the best in us. For indeed, when one falls or fails, we all suffer. And equally, when one wins, triumphs, and succeeds, like Jean Abbas, we all rejoice and celebrate and showcase the true social cohesion and national binding and bonding. We will then become the Gambia and the Gambians that were known before, regaining our true Gambianness, the smiling coast, the friendly people, the supportive and truly tolerant country, the people who will say like that king said, I am as you are, my people as your people, my horses as your horses. Ladies and gentlemen, it calls for all hands on deck. And I know we, in our own religious institution and the group I belong to, we try to engage with the TRRC and we are open to any other partner for this country to work well so that we bequeath a good legacy to our children. We must reintroduce a new Gambian culture, a new Gambian mindset, and eschew things that are wrong. The way forward is reconciliation, restoration, and revival. The Kilifas must come again. Truth must be spoken again. The integrity of us religious leaders must come back again. State House is not where we belong to. We belong to our churches and our mosques. And any time we go there, we must go to speak truth and not to get money. Yeah. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, as a preacher, when you are speaking and somebody says the things you have said, we normally say, you stole my points. Horaja, you stole the national anthem from me. Because that is how I wanted to end. I wasn't here when you were singing it. But this is my last page. As you can see, I even have it red, blue, green. But she already, as a good lawyer, stole it from me. <laughs> so as I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, please listen. Listen carefully. Listen attentively. And listen with sober reflection. I will take the national pledge. It is the combination of government and people working together in unison and harmony that still lead us to achieve the progress we all desire. We must stand together as one people with one goal and move forward as one nation. For if we insist on pursuing our personal goals without keeping our collective objectives and responsibilities in mind, then indeed, we shall fall. Let us renew these promises we made to ourselves and to our country at the time of independence as enshrined in our national anthem, which reads, for the Gambia, our homeland. We strive and work and pray that all may live in unity, freedom, and peace each day. Let justice guide our actions towards the common good. Let us join our diverse, different peoples to prove that though divided in persuasion, in politics, even in gender, in creed, we can prove man's brotherhood. We can live together. We pledge our firm allegiance and we, promise, we renew our promise. Our promise we renew. Keep us, great God of the nations, to this Gambia ever true. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.